big bang. When is the mobility big bang? Automotive started to become a, a VC. Is that still going on? It's such a no-brainer to switch to electric cars. You are not moving fast enough. Welcome to the show. Okay, this is going to be a long one. I already have my whiskey sour here. It's about getting the data into the oh, car. I would form like a Beatles formation. Or a fascination with cars. So we were wondering, is there any kind of connection or link to transport or mobility, you know, coming from your family maybe or your personal background? I mean, it was more like when you go very far back, back, it's more a fascination with cars that many, many people have and share. So when you are like uh, in sixth grade, seventh grade, and you're like buying automotor sport magazines or so, <laughs> like, like really fascinated by some cool cars. But in uh, my studies, we had a different kind of experience where we, I was staying in an apartment building that may, houses many students. And some of us, because it was more in the country, not in a big um, city, more kind of like a smaller village dominated by the, the university, basically, um, a, a lot of us had cars, actually. And we had this kind of setup where you have everybody's car parked out front and underneath and like all around across the city. And we basically said, uh, and some of us didn't, I didn't initially, I didn't have a car in the first years, but I thought they're all standing here. And I was, we were talking to friends how awesome it would be if we, let's say, we just put a hand on the windshield. And, it opens up and we take it uh, for the afternoon or for the hour and then we just put it back afterwards. And and we are like tinkering basically at the time with different ideas and um, experimenting things. And this was 2009, I believe. So um, there was sort of a research experiment by Daimler in Ulm called Car2Go. Um, and um, there were some also more kind of classic car sharing systems that had key box for cars or so. But we were going out and trying to find some hardware that we got from somebody in Switzerland and then some software from somebody in Canada and basically put like a, one of the very first um, self-service um, station-based car rentals, basically. You, really, you go there, open your phone, browser, not, <laughs> not a lot of, uh, uh, not, a, not the same smartphone as today, but basically with your phone, you can actually make this car open up. And that was extremely new and strange and like nerdy to do at the time. And um, this was a first small startup that we called Campus Car, Campus Car, because it was on a university campus and then a second campus, but that we ran also just next to actually studying, just seeing how everything works. Hopefully this will like pay for the cost, pay for the uh, cars that we have there. We had a few smart cars, one series BMW, and um, yeah, try to basically mainly finance this whole thing by putting a lot of advertising on the cars. They were full of <laughs> advertising. And, um, and that was the first step in this direction. And then I um, was sort of um, playing around with some other ideas as well. One of them was that we had a similar kind of idea. It was all about uh, utilization and asset sharing and so on uh, about apartments, basically. Now, in the summer, most students leave from this place and they um, sort of, you know, close their windows and put, sh shut everything up. And then all the apartments are empty um, in the region, except for those few PhD students staying behind. I was one of them staying behind in the summer, kind of having barbecues, most apartments locked up. And then there was um, a huge event coming up the, the next year, which everybody in the region was ready for. And they were making like big infrastructure investments. And they were like gearing up for this like nationwide event that they were going to host over there for a few uh, weeks. And it was in the media how they would not have enough, um, you know, um, hotel room capacity for this. And we basically thought, well, we can build something. And we wrote to the uh, sort of org organizing committee and we told them, if we can use your logo, if you link to us, if you basically give us demand, then we will have, we will build a website that all of our student friends who are not here can list their apartment and other people in the area that have a spare bedroom and so on can list the apartment. And, and then we built this. So now we were mainly PhD students, but we had like a small tinkery car sharing and like a small apartment, regional apartment sharing site in parallel. And um, a year, a year, um, a year into this, we um, yeah, learned about another apartment sharing uh, site that uh, gained a lot of traction in the US, which was Airbnb. Um, and um, this was about 2010, beginning of 2011. And I basically um, kind of figured out that this is gaining a lot of traction in the US, but it will probably go the way that um, some other models had before, where um, basically there's 
um, a German copy factory at the time, uh, mainly copying um, Rocket Internet, which would kind of set out to probably also do this very quickly, very big, and then uh, try to sell their international part to them. So I messaged the founders of Airbnb, not knowing them, um, kind of email guessing. So you write to Brian at Airbnb, Brian Chesky, Brian underscore Chesky, whatever combination you can think of. And we told them basically, um, you have an awesome product. You are going to have to internationalize. It's probably going to happen to you that somebody's going to do that faster. And here are the examples where that has worked out before. Um, and then uh, we can help. And um, they said, that's very interesting. Let's meet. So we, I, I flew over there um, kind of very spontaneously some days later, paying for my own ticket, not knowing where this would lead or when I would um, come back and basically um, met them and talked to them and so on. And they, um, in a matter of a few days, basically um, decided to take over what we had. And this was Airbnb's first acquisition in 2011. And so then I had to concentrate fully on, you know, this business, apartment sharing. Um, somebody else was kind of continuing with the car sharing, but I was for um, about three years fully focused on now um, trying to launch Airbnb internationally and basically growing apartment, sharing this whole idea, which uh, gained a lot of opposition here as well. Basically, people thought that's very unsafe and very um, strange thing to do, basically. But um, there were 30 people at Airbnb at the time. There were five of us over here. So combined 35 and then it just grew faster and faster. Um, by the time I left, about not even three years later, there were 1,500 people. We had a lot of international offices and so on. And when I left, I had basically always lived in Germany, but traveled to San Francisco um, at least once a month, sometimes for two, three days, sometimes for two weeks, working with the team there and going this long way. I always try to get a little bit out for myself as well, not just for this sort of mission and um, reached out more and more to also other um, founders in um, San Francisco, because I figured out how easy it was to meet with them. Basically, they were very open and very interested and curious. And if you basically wrote to them, hey, it's pretty cool what you're doing with the pink mustaches or so, or so. it's pretty actually pretty awesome idea. Uh, lift what you are doing. Um, um, can I, I'm in San Francisco next week. Can I uh, come for a coffee? I'd like to know how you're doing this and um, maybe talk about it. And they were all willing to meet. And so I met a lot of um, other founders and different models that I looked at. I looked at relay rides, which became Turo, and met with those guys, and um, Lyft, and um, a lot of mobility people. And basically, um, thought at the end of the day, this ride sharing um, thing is quite revolutionary. The way it was done in a kind of yeah P two P setup in San Francisco. And um, that we would definitely need a model like this over here too. It could definitely because taxi is like a business class product in Germany. It's pretty expensive. 80-90% um, of Germans never use a taxi because it's yeah just not reasonable basically. Um, and um, at the same time, public transport works well in some on some routes in some areas, but not at all times of day and not in all directions. So we I basically asked some of the usual suspects, some of the typical almost typical I would say German investors at the time, um, if they would invest if we launched uh, uh, ride sharing in Germany. And I asked six, you know, um, seed funds and angels and they all said yes so that became very easy and uh, basically left airbnb and um, there were some you know individual people that came into this new team and we um, within three four months launched ride sharing in hamburg and berlin um, later in the year 2014 uber also came to germany and this whole topic gained a lot of um, public momentum basically um, there was a lot of um debate coming up because taxis were mobilizing against this and we had um, sort of a peak a few months after the launch of um, intense you know media and government pressure on the topic basically in the news in newspapers almost every day for a few weeks um, in the eight o'clock news over here when there were taxi protests organized around our office police had to come keep people from coming into the office and um, there were basically you know um, all the <laughs> news crews here and that was very interesting on the one hand to be able to get the word out and really debate. This culminated in a call from somebody that introduced himself as kind of a chief of staff in the chancellery in Germany. And he basically said, um, you have to stop this or we are going to stop you basically. And we um, got a lot of um, letters of different colors, yellow letters, then red letters basically saying, 
um, this is very illegal and you're liable and the company is and now you are personally liable and so on. And like a lot of pressure to actually stop what we were trying to do. And so we had to decide at the time if we were going to pour our seed funding into a lot of legal battles um, and uh, lobby work, which we started out doing, but this is going to take many years. Or if we just take the whole product and idea into maybe countries that are more either more open to innovation or slower to react, however you want to put that, basically just more easygoing about these models. And so we already, towards the end of the first year, um, ceased, stopped operations in Germany and launched the same product first in Budapest and then Warsaw and then Prague and became kind of right hailing in Eastern Europe and um, were competing against Uber successfully in Budapest and so on. And yeah, did this for for about a year or a year and a half. And then there was sort of 2015, end of 2015, I think there was a kind of notion in the mobility industry that um, Uber is taking on record levels of funding and um, will likely roll over everything and everybody and maybe dominate um, this space um, globally. That's kind of a view that's, I, I think, not at all true anymore today when they've retreated from a lot of geographies and um, are yeah, more focused on some models. But um, at the time, it seemed very daunting, very dominant. And when we uh, went out to race a Series A, basically for an Uber-like model in Eastern Europe, that was very difficult, almost impossible. And so we were forced to think a bit harder than just to say, um, this is ride-sharing in Eastern Europe, um, and to see if we can come up with also more product innovation. And at the time, like after, I think about 35 partner rounds with VCs between Moscow and San Francisco, anywhere like in, in London, in Luxembourg, in Germany, um, in the US and so on. Lots of VC pitches over a few months, lots of partner rounds. There's a lot of feedback collected as well. And they basically, um, we basically kind of evolved what we were pushing as a message. And we basically in the end said, um, we have this experience in ride sharing, but we're going to try and turn this into a real carpooling in cities, kind of like Uber meets blah, blah car. So we're going to really make it a lot more affordable because your driver is not going to be a person that spends their time taking you where you want to go, but we're going to match you with somebody who is going in this direction anyhow. And maybe that's not going to work 24 seven in all directions, going in the middle of the night to the airport or so, but it's going to definitely work in the rush hour, going into the city in the evenings, going out of the cities. As a point of clarification, and these points in time that you were in, um, you know, Budapest, Warsaw, uh, in Prague, were you were you white labeled or was this no. under the Vulnerable Mobility NAM? You were you were as a ride hailing yeah. company under your own brand. We, okay, we were B two C basically, yeah. And um, and so the, the the first product was ride hailing direct to consumers under the under the brand Wonder Car actually Wonder Car. So um, now we um, basically scaled this to some point, but investors are very careful about competing more against Uber in this way. And we said, let's see if we can turn this into carpooling in cities, kind of blah, blah, car meets Uber. This would be a radical sort of new model. Um, and we uh, called this Funda Carpool. And basically, we're, I think, fortunate enough that um, some people in the team said, um, what might be the best cities in the world to launch this? If this can even work, where could we have a liquid carpool system, like instant carpooling in cities? And maybe it's not actually Budapest, where in the end of the day, it's kind of a smaller city. You can take your bike or maybe, I don't know, there are, there's a reasonably good bus infrastructure and so on. Maybe um, the city where this would really solve a lot of pain, both on the driver's side, who urgently needs to make some extra money, and on the passenger side, who's really facing a very difficult commute right now in public transport, that would be a mega cities in emerging markets. Manila is one of the worst cities for traffic, or um, like a Delhi. Um, and like a, maybe a Rio de Janeiro. And so we launched this product beginning of 2016 in Manila. We again left everything behind and we went, okay, with this learning, with the same team now to Manila, make a showcase out of that you can have carpooling in cities in Manila. At this point, had you raised your Series A already? Is this with the Series A money? This is when you're pivoting again. Yeah. Series, series A is to... Um, not do ride sharing against Uber, but have a product that's actually carpooling based on the ride sharing knowledge. And then 
compete on ride sharing with price because you use a different kind of supply. Yeah. And at this point, I'm curious, have you discontinued your operations in Eastern Europe yeah. or is that still no, going no. on? Okay. So every time you do this, you're just like, you're just throwing it out and you're, you're throwing something else against the wall. That's, I mean, that's the way you have to do it. So I, how did you all land on Manila? Like what research went into that? Was there individual experience that people had with, with living in Manila or experience in Manila? Or was it just sort of like a data dump of, of World Economic Forum information? And you're like, okay, we're going to go to these places that have you know, most time in transportation or most time yeah. in traffic. It was a three months process where we start with some, a uh, lot of data basically um, in a kind of scorecard. And you look at things like average commute times, the cost of owning a car compared to average household incomes, cost of gas, um, cell phone penetration, also Facebook penetration, because we had a lot of experience in that we want to use that as an acquisition channel. And, um, and then other factors, um, like the quality of public, public transport and so on. And basically that's they are giving us a short list of about 10 cities that we then test out. So we run launch campaigns um, localized and we act as if we are launching in all these cities, run campaigns in different social media channels, paid and non-paid basically, and see what the feedback is, what the reaction is. And some markets that might look similar on the surface in terms of data, the reaction might be, um, very critical. Oh, this is super unsafe. I hope my daughter will never use this. And I'm like, oh my God, I will report you to the authorities, basically. And in others, they, are like, they will be like, oh, this is um, awesome. Look, this is like what we are kind of doing informally, but now there's an app for it. And there's a word for it already, for example, like in Manila. And um, so you get, you collect this feedback and you go, you go from 10 to 5 to 3 to 2 to 1 city by actually launching more and more seriously and actually acquiring users and seeing if you can get liquidity on some routes to finally just one city. And then all resources on one market because you have to make it liquid on certain routes so that they would actually match and they would actually find a driver and actually work. And we got Manila to be um, the first city in the world to have yeah, a liquid instant carpooling market. 300,000 rides in the first year and then like tens of thousands of rides a week um, in the in the second week and you can basically in the rush hour in the mornings evenings open um, the app and have a product that competes with grab and uber on a radically cheaper price because um, there's going to be like a stranger come in and um, pick you up you have to walk to a pickup spot you have to walk a few hundred meters to a pickup spot and they take you into the city there was a huge active community um, around this like local groups they create their own merchandising they hold their own events kind of hosted by communi local community captains and so on and there was a lot of liquidity on this, but now comes um, the point of basically monetization. So how do you monetize something like this? We um, are continue to be in a lot of sort of exchange with other mobility founders, also in the US and Israel and China. And uh, we you know, talk to people that have similar problems, similar models. One is Blavacar, of course, they still have kind of a bit of a monetization um, challenge, but others are the big bike sharing people in China. So OFO, OFO founders and people like that. And we talk to them and they say, look, we have 100 million users in China, our bikes are used the whole time everywhere, but it's kind of almost for free at this point. And what we're really building is not um, a mobility service company, but we're building a mobility-based ad network. I guess you're gonna try to monetize this through um, user, like uh, location-based data, and um, of course sell this data, but also show uh, users very specific location-based advertising. Okay, how do you just get in, in touch with the founders of Ofo in China? Like, I understand you being in San Francisco with the early days of Airbnb, where you're getting a chance to sort of like network with people there, and the Silicon Valley way is very open. But how did you, you know, how do you meet founders in these other places who are doing mobility stuff? Blah blah car makes sense. They're they're in France, but you know, where where does the Chinese connection come in with Bunder, and 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 how how did those conversations start there? I think we always approach people um, directly and are surprised how typically they would also answer. And um, if you put in um, the location and you say, I'm planning to be in Beijing next week and it's very fascinating what you're doing. I think it's awesome. I'm trying to do this and this. Would you, would you be willing to meet maybe for 20 minutes, for half an hour for a coffee? They will re almost never say no. Maybe if they do, um, then you have somebody else and then you say, oh, I'm meeting this and this person on the day. And um, if you still have some time, 
I would love to also come. Just tell me when and where, basically. So you can maybe build some credibility in this way. So you were traveling to China. Yeah. And then we have basically three intense days kind of packed. It's kind of a visum that you get on arrival in China if you come from Japan. Um, and you can't leave Beijing, but then it's very, very fast and very easy. And um, Beijing is big enough anyhow. And then you meet a lot of people within three days. And you have like the, you know, person chart of strategy at Didi um, in the morning and then lunch with like another big carpool founder. It's like a very modest, small, new carpool startup with 100 million users that you've never heard about. <laughs> and then like, a, and then like, a, um, yeah. Um, other people in the afternoon. From this, we also we also met people that are today in the team that are now working with us in Germany. Because then sometimes you meet some people that are curious to maybe work in Europe and so on. And so the connection gets stronger over time as um, now there's a mix between teams also. But was this also the way you met Sam back then, your co-founder uh, in San Francisco, that you just you know tried to reach out to people, or was it was it another occasion? It was um, basically through common connections, yeah. Actually, also through 500 Startups, like you mentioned before, that you worked there. There was a guy we both know at 500 Startups, and um, yeah, he was interested in moving into mobility and um, also spending more time in Germany, where he spent time as a child. His parents are American, but they um, worked here for a while. And yeah, we basically then decided to work together. What made you so confident? Uh, because, you know, there are a lot of, let's say, blueprints on what kind of partnerships are going to work and, 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 and of course, the opposite. So what made you so confident back then then that Sam is the right one to somehow also complement your skill set and, and make it happen? I guess uh, you did not uh, know each other already for years. So I guess there must be any kind of... A uh, very particular skill or thing uh, you, you saw in Sam when when hooking up, right, and vice versa. Yes, and that's not necessarily um, just complementarity. Like classically, you might think, okay, I'm from a business school, so let's find a technical co-founder or so. Um, but uh, more that we can um, be very good also in some situations together, and. Um, then a lot of trust and he also reminded me of people that I had known before maybe um, in school or so before and that I um, worked with before um, sometimes in the end of the day you can um, yeah, there are some profiles of people that you um, maybe are drawn to or so and that you meet again and again and then you um, establish um, trust very quickly but we didn't um, do this based on like a assessment like kind of a, like when a boy group gets casted or so and you think okay <laughs> do we touch all the areas or so but uh, more um, out of um, kind of hustling together because we can trust each other quickly we can throw off a lot of ideas it's a lot more fun to move around um, together like this also the Beijing trip for example we did it together um, it's going to be a lot more valuable than if we go there individually but it's, right. doesn't, it doesn't mean together that, like we already cover everything there are more people needed um, in the leadership team now to cover. Right, right. The way you described your market approach, I found really interesting, you know, very, very analytical, um, trying to get a glimpse on what's happening on an international level in urban areas and where there might be a need for a company like Wundercar back then. I think that's that's interesting because it's not necessarily the way you would uh, most most startups at least would uh, approach their their launch, and it's quite also bold as uh, you know as a German American company. One of the first cities is uh, was to be decided to be Manila, right? So is Sam the same kind of uh, guy that that has this analytical uh, analytical approach? I think that's that's probably also a little bit of your background coming from consultancy, right? Or is it is it an, uh, he, is he another type of guy that that is rather you know emotional so how, how does it fit together that that's that's what i wanted to go with the question i think it's uh, what's important is he's also very international um he had a startup in south america before and um yeah grew up as a child in germany then studied in california and so it's very normal for him to travel internationally his wife's actually his wife's family is from taiwan so they also grew up in la but um there's family very spread out across the world And um, he speaks Mandarin because of that. So 
um, very international mindset, but the personalities are different. I'm definitely probably more analytical and also more um, kind of rushing faster into decisions, whereas he's uh, much more empathetic and more thinking of many different aspects. So you will not, not maybe get an answer right there on the spot very quickly. <laughs> you might if you push, but it's going to be better maybe to wait um, for a day and then have really a m much more nuanced kind of answer. Do you know your Myers-Briggs personality types? Yeah, that's INTJ. <laughs> In for you and what about for him? Uh, I forgot. I don't, I'm not sure. Um, okay. But... <laughs> TJ. Yeah. That makes sense that your your the data is very important. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um so I'm I'm kind of curious since you've spoken a lot about and I know that we that the time is sort of escaping us, but you've spoken a lot about this analytical approach to looking at cities and looking at urban environments. And I know that Wonder has gone through so many more iterations of products and introduce so many more product lines as you've gone through the years. And I know we didn't give you a chance to sort of speak through all of that. That's one, final, that's one final step. I'm curious um, if, if you feel like this analysis of cities is something that is continued inside the business. And is that data that you all are using to think about when you are cre creating new products, for example, or figuring out new ways to partner with, you know, be it operators or be it government. We do try to keep um, a holistic understanding and we use also other um, institutions, organizations to um, exchange um, and kind of level up. Um, and that's, for example, McKinsey's Center of Future Mobility. And we would have workshops together and they bring some parts and we bring some parts and then yeah we add to what they are saying what's maybe missing and then they kind of challenge us on our strategy or we do that with people from the world economic forum where we are part of the global new mobility coalition and i'm um, talking to them and so on so we try to um yeah understand to some extent what's going on and it's very mind-blowing of course it's very hard to really wrap your head around all that's going on in mobility around the world therein lies a big opportunity because it's not really not going to be like a monopoly or an oligopoly even probably of maybe five or three, you know, big international companies dominating mobility around the world. It's extremely um, complex um, and maybe you can see some common patterns, but it's just crazily complex of people living in cities, in the country, um, in um, countries of different income levels and so on. And um, I think that um, we are now trying, now in our final stage, we're basically building um, a tech platform for new mobility operators, public and private ones around the world to launch and scale their mobility services. And that extends into the financing of vehicles and the, um, actually some, some vehicles, some hardware that you need into the software solutions that you need. And then opening up into a marketplace that third parties um, can um, integrate their tools um, via the marketplace. But um, that's, already used by a very um, diverse set of um, operators from very big um, you know oil and gas companies um, oems the german oems ford toyota and so on to very new um, entrepreneurs like um, a person that launches a service in reykjavik and that's like his new business a very small no vcs involved just a business person and um, we are trying to um, also spread this or make this diversity of solutions possible because I think that's the only way to actually have a transition into shared electric mobility faster if you can have a lot of local entrepreneurship. This kind of one-size-fits-all solutions are meeting a lot of resistance, um, if not the least with also governments around the world because it's a very sensitive topic um, how... Um, access to transportation is organized, what working conditions there are, um, how that gets controlled. Um, and so it's, yeah, what we, what we and what our clients provide in shared mobility um, in some ways could be classified as public transportation. And in, there are some, uh, probably many in the future geographies that the cities also feel like this is something they should at least maybe regulate tightly or even provide, provision themselves. And um, that's very hard to catch with one uh, solution that fits all. So we're trying to look at what are the common building blocks, host those, and then you can come end-to-end -to, -end to us, basically, um, for a product that's, I mean, 
not even branded by you. It's just basically um, off the shelf um, scooters include or vehicles included, software included, everything included. Unpack and launch this in Reykjavik or anywhere you are. Um, to um, just using individual components. Like you're a big player, you have in-house technology, but you're not going to build everything in-house that's already also available off the shelf. So it's modularized, um, serving a long tail and also serving bigger players. And the example for us for that now would be a Shopify from e-commerce, basically. Shopify is a platform that enables small and big e-commerce players to basically compete on an eye level with Amazon by having you know, competitive technology and access to everything very easily that they couldn't possibly build in-house. And we are trying to provide something similar to operators that are competing also with the big guys um, or our big guys that want, want to run it if efficiently um, in mobility. Gunnar, the, the analogy you like to, to use is to become um, the Bosch of the 21st century or the Bosch of new mobility and And of course, um, probably one of the first associations is right that Bosch is, is, is a quite innovative company, but it's also quite old corporation, right? Could you explain a little bit about what is behind the, the idea of Bosch as a role model? Sure. Also, there are many connections between us and um, Bosch already for some years. This afternoon, I talked to their chief digital officer also again, and I think that, of course, they would say, well, Bosch is going to be the Bosch of new mobility. But um, I, think, <laughs> I think that... Um, I mean, they are going to play in this and we are going to play in this, but we have um, yeah, a good chance to play a big role. And putting this example uh, is basically supposed to um, yeah, be a provocative in some ways to make a point. Um, because what does Bosch um, stand for, among many other things, is um, they are a very long-term um, company, not just one that recently got up. It's like a hundred-year company um, soon um, that is... Um, very innovative te technology-wise, um, running, um, basically enabling other people's products and services in a way that is very profitable for them, better EBIT margins than some of the OEMs in most years, right. um, and has a reputation to be a very good employer, and is also actually the largest charity in Germany. Bosch Foundation is a massive, every year, huge spend um, charity in Germany. And those are some aspects um, that are very fascinating if you think about what kind of company ideally in a best case scenario you would like to create. Um, it's not just looking at uh, maybe let's like push up the valuation and who might be willing to buy this. The ideal best case is that you have a profitable, independent, very um, tech uh, driven, very attractive as an employer and actually like immensely um, also um, influential and positive on kind of societal um, change and right. um, impact in the world. So Bosch um, is a cool example to look at sometimes to not be only in the startup mindset, but to also think about uh, what could a very yeah, well-managed company at scale look like. At the same time, I think that Bosch um, is, of course, um, kind of a hardware first company. Traditionally, uh, we are um, software first. Now we are beginning to also go into hardware. We have some hardware engineers on the team who are learning on this side. They are very much pushing into software. I think that um, yeah, the, um, the space is huge, but just to make it clear what the ambition is, not one product that uh, we um, then sell everything as quickly as possible, but it's going to be a range of products um, with an ambition level on all these fronts that I mentioned, basically. I'm Curious, you spoke quite a quite a bit before about your relation to government and 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 thinking about this Bosch and thinking about what they offer. Um, in addition to thinking about your sort of unique selling proposition in terms of all of the services and products that you all offer, um, what what do you think about or, or what's your take on sort of the role of, of cities um, in helping you to become sort of the the Bosch of the 21st century, like the Is that cooperation, do you think, um, really important? Or, or do you think that it's going to be sort of an afterthought? And if you've been selling, and I know you've sold into a, a few companies, a few cities, but you know, what's the reception in the sort of the government space to the work that you all are doing? It used to be that we thought about um, the role of cities in mobility as um, like a distraction, like a nuisance, basically, you know, 
we have these product ideas that we want to launch and now they come and, and maybe have questions about it and want to regulate it and so on and want us to go slower. Um, but um, that's a kind of narrow view because cities, um, it's a political question how much mandate cities have. Um, and in many geographies, many developed um, uh, countries especially, um, that goes pretty far in terms of some basic infrastructure topics, in terms of um, housing, energy, mobility. And the, the tendency is not in most uh, geographies that cities will provide less uh, mobility, less public infrastructure, less public transportation in the future, but maybe actually more. So um, in Germany, the conservative party, basically CDU, is talking about maybe let's experiment with like free public transport. So it's not just the Green Party, it's basically a mainstream idea to maybe also push the climate agenda more through a kind of publicly um, enabled um, transportation options. And when you think about that, um, public transportation is going to become more digital. And what we had as emerging new digital products, be it ride hailing or asset sharing, car sharing, scooter sharing, those are like public transportation products in the end of the day. So we're going to have the big old bus that goes around every 10 minutes and in an analog way, maybe become a more flexible um, vehicle that gets maybe routed more dynamically, but then you are already close to like a pooled um, ride sharing. Or when you look at who's running the big bike sharing systems in Germany today, it's not Ofo and Mobike, it's um, yeah, Stadtrat basically, currently run by Deutsche Bahn in most cases because they won that tender, but it's the cities who determined how that should look like. It should be station-based across the whole city, not just in the most lucrative neighborhoods, for example. Um, and then they tender it out. Who wants to operate this for us? And um, I think there's a, there's a role for us to play because I think that cities, while they want to see certain things and maybe in some cases run certain things, are likely not going to maybe build all the technology behind it themselves. It wouldn't make sense for each city to kind of build their own technology in this. They're going to... Um, basically find a supplier for that and tender it out. And we are gonna basically then, for example, partner with somebody who does operations to go into this tender and say, um, yeah, we, we are gonna provide um, some hardware components and the software and, so, and, and another partner is gonna do the day-to-day -day operations on the ground. So I have a really controversial thesis that I have been toying around with. And a lot of the statements that you just said in your, in, your, in your answer sort of point to that. And I'm curious to hear your perspective on it. So feel free to challenge this. You can tell me that it doesn't make sense. Or if it's, but my thesis around specifically shared micromobility in cities is that it actually is only going to work when cities own it, when it's a, a city provided service and is bundled with sort of public transportation. I think that's the only way that you make the unit economics of it work. So I'm curious as someone who sees this happen around and you sort of speak to the idea of cities owning more and more of this, do you think that that trend, you know, I know bike sharing is obviously, it was sort of started in that space. Scooters, I think, is more of a departure. Um, you know, you have more private companies, but I think for, for the most part, but I'm curious, like, do you think that in general, there's going to be sort of resurgence of, of the cities as the, the, the leaders in that space? And do you think that micro mobility operators will you have more insight into this than I do, but like, what do you think the profitability landscape looks like for, for those companies if cities are, are more of the people that own it as opposed to private owners? I think there would, there's a, like the spectrum of outcomes where it's from totally unregulated, anybody can launch and put the prices that they want and serve only the neighborhoods that they want to basically it's operated by the city. And it's like maybe a city employee that goes out to charge them and um, the city bought these assets and has build the software in-house. And in between, um, coming from the sort of free market side, one step to a more regulated direction is what a lot of cities are doing now, maybe Paris, Lyon and so on, that they would say, okay, we're going to have four operators. We have certain things that we like about operators. You can apply. Please present how you would do it um, if you were one of the four in the next two years. And so it's already beneficial for the operators. Now you don't have all-out competition. Um, you are rewarded for maybe um, having a good strategy that also works well for the city. Um, and then another step in this direction is that the city would say, yeah, we have certain parameters that we give and we're gonna tender um, this out now. It's not, it's not just you present who you are to us, but we're gonna say, like they do in bike sharing now, okay, we want it to be stationary. We prefer that over free floating. 
and we want it to be in those and those areas. You know, when you put stations, you need to put them in this certain way. Or um, in terms of bikes, we mandate that you have to have also cargo bikes or blah, 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 whatever, because we think that's going to be better for our transportation mix. So they put more parameters, and then whoever is going to build their solution around that, you can bid in a tender and then win it for a while. And I think that um, in reality, the most efficient systems are going to be somewhere in the middle for sure, right? Not the entirely run by cities with a city employee and everything. It's like not a lot of learning taking place when you like invent it for just one city. But um, it's going to be that the city sets some parameters um, according to their overall like mobility strategy. And then um, private companies are going to try to um, fulfill that in the most efficient way and bid on it, basically. Uh, Gunnar, I would like to, to hear a little bit more about, you know, the DNA of Wunder. Um, Wunder, for me, always has been a company that that some, somehow really authentic, you know, with, with that history uh, of, 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 of pivots and, and finally, uh, you know, becoming this one of the role models, actually, in new mobility in, in, in Europe. And, and uh, also, you know, visiting you in your headquarter always felt like, okay, there's, there's really something special, there's something happening. So could you maybe describe... What is the typical wonder, uh, wonder employee, or what is a typical team member, uh, if, if there is something like that, to to get a better feeling on on your company and 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 the culture in particular? Um, in our mission, there are two parts, and we kind of have this paragraph like for the mission that's in the beginning of team meetings, and some is like okay, <laughs> you kind of forget about it, even though it's there every every week, every time. But it has this like externally focused part, kind of what you want to do in the world, whatever push. The transition accelerate, accelerate the transition to more sustainable mobility, and then it has this internal part about um, what kind of company would be created along the way. So it's a profitable, um, so it's an independent, values-driven company that um, attracts and retains exceptionally entrepreneurial people. And what does that basically mean? In the end of the day, I think that um, we can only run at the speed that we are running and also absorb the changes that we sometimes have to make um, if people on the team take a lot of ownership for their areas and kind of also accept that they come into a very unusual um, circumstance. It's going to be a little bit tiring. Sometimes we use an analogy um, between you know, soccer and startups um, that roughly basically would say, in Germany, more or less everybody's playing soccer, but mostly what we mean when we say that is we play on the weekend, like with our friends a little bit. And then um, some people play um, also maybe at Bavaria Munich, you know, and like in a kind of um, Champions League, and that's very different kind of playing. And, um, and when I say, for example, in, in Bavaria Munich, um, my cousin, assume my cousin's in Bavaria Munich, and I would ask him, well, do you really have to like go to practice every day? I mean, can't you do that from home? Like you put up this camera, like you live in Starnberg, so you just stay down there, you know, save the commute, just do it like that. And then um, do you really have to fly to games on the weekend, like working on the weekend? It's like shitty, right? But that wouldn't make sense because he's playing at Bavaria Munich. It's a very special time. It's very, they try to really win this championship, but he might maybe also won't do it his whole life. He's going to be there maybe for five years or so, maybe 10 years if he's like really crazy. And, um, and that's kind of different. And the same in startups. So everybody more or less, not really, but feels like sometimes has a startup in Germany. But there are also different ways of running that. There can be profitable, really cool, you know, um, healthy ways of, you know, running a startup somehow. And then there can be ways like to try and um, also play in this international Champions League. And whether we want to or not, we have by taking on for example, the venture capital that we have taken on and the valuations that we've taken this money at with a promise to make it even much higher, we are definitely playing in this um, international um, league. So you have to, as a team, um, team member, you have to then also want that and kind of enjoy that and, and get ready for, I don't know, you might have a lot of support also in some ways, but you are also going to be really challenged um, a lot. You can't compare can't compare yourself and your circumstances to maybe everybody else who says I'm also in a startup. And you have to be competitive, right, as well. And comp be competitive. I think that um, that's a very diff difficult question. I mean, um, 
I hope that we are not very competitive um, internally. Um, I think that um, it must be extremely um, sharing information and helping each other out and so on and make it really um, open and not try to shine individually. Um, externally, whether we can be competitive um, against um, those, sometimes we are. I mean, sometimes I, we, we hate to lose <laughs> in a tender or like in a client and then it's like, how could this happen? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Damn, we have to, have to go back and see how this can happen. But um, the ideal state is um, definitely not to think about competition too much and really focus on um, the clients and the product and have clients that are really um, super, super happy. And that's what we try to capture like in service and in testimonials that we then record and run and make sure that they are like totally, that they feel like it's not even comparable. We don't go to you because, I don't know, you might be 20% cheaper, which we're not actually, the strategy is to be always slightly more expensive, but not too much, mm -hmm. but not, but because they're like, this is end to end. And if there's a problem, um, I mean, I can be successful as an entrepreneur, as a company with you as a partner. And um, that's what we need to get our clients to. They don't want to go anywhere. It's, it's a holistic package of um, the technology they get, the people they get to interact with, other possibilities they have, connections that they can have um, through us um, that also come out, I don't know, even um, physically through the summit that we're hosting um, once a year. Like people come together internationally and um, gather for like a day, two days and, um, and you can make um, connections that you maybe thought were impossible before. So basically um, have really a lot of advantages by um, working with us as your partner. So kind of more a client and product focus than a competition focus would be ideal, but sometimes there's that competitive element, of course. Right. And Gunnar, uh, would you say that the most of the people that you meet in job interviews are actually really prepared for working for a, a company like a startup like Wunder Mobility? Um, and, and, and of course, I think my question already implies uh, where I'm coming from, you know, having ramped up myself uh, mobility ventures in the past, I was struggling with uh, what what the universities and what the schools basically spit out. And, and, and somehow it is it is cool for young people to join startup companies. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it, uh, it, it is something where... If, if you manage to create desire around a team and around a brand, it, it, it feels like, oh, okay, this is what I always wanted to do. But actually, the, the way most people are prepared for life and are prepared for their professional life in particular, I would say it's rather nine to five or it's rather, okay, after university, uh, if you have successfully convinced someone to hire you, you have done 80% of, of the job, right? So... How do you make sure that you choose for the right people? And uh, do you have some recommendations on what, what there might be or w where it might make sense to, to change things also in the educational system, in particular in Germany, to uh, improve the quality of, of potential new stuff? I think that how people um, look at um, their job and opportunities and what they would like to um, do in this part of their week, let's say, it's always only one um, part of me, basically then um, it's influenced a lot by role models, basically, and what they see their friends doing and other people doing. And um, it used to be um, that we don't have a lot of these, maybe also role models in a very entrepreneurial and very um, startup, um, uh, ambitious startup kind of direction. And um, I think it's, of course, um, changing. I remember that when I worked at Airbnb, we uh, were building up international and trying to hire people also internationally. And the ambitions... Um, of the team in San Francisco were extremely high for candidates to be like extremely like basically dream about working there already for a while and like really really um, be like with a whole life um, behind um, wanting to do this and that's was almost um, impossible because we can we just didn't have um, this this whole idea um, that you could work in this kind of environment it's a little bit funky, but it can turn out really well for you. It can be super interesting, exciting, also turn out very well financially, potentially. That whole idea wasn't there for um, uh, most people yet. And I think that um, our one thing that comes to my mind is like the big funnel that we also have to go through to make it finally work, to find um, really good matches for our team. Um, there's a number that's basically 
the acceptance ratio from people submitting their application to starting a contract um, is 1.5% in the people team. So they have to go through a lot of process with a lot of people to finally arrive there. Um, but I think that um, it's a big, sometimes also, yeah, more an investment um, into um, people to um, kind of maybe invite them into it and you can't hold it against people that they haven't sometimes maybe had a lot of, um, maybe even considered this also different kind of uh, working. Whether it's, I also think um, we have to be like put things into perspective though it's not the, the right thing or the best way for a majority or for everybody even. So it's just one uh, way that should be out there as an option if you're interested. Um, you would maybe kind of know how this could look like. Um, you, shouldn't, you should not not know about it, but it's also not the kind of um, desirable way for everybody necessarily, I think, to go in this um, very intense kind of few years to try and really push something new. It's much harder than to go into a company that's already figured a lot of things out. Yeah, the, I don't know, spontaneously, maybe we should think about it better, but spontaneously, it could be that it's like so much um, fun every day and that it, it has this kind of like a college-like uh, um, group of friends um, atmosphere. Um, it might look like this when you just go by the age of people. You're like, oh, wow, this could all be my friends. But um, that's like you make a little bit like a... Um, kind of switch uh, then or like uh, that's like unrealistic. This is kind of still work that we do together in like very informal and friendly ways, uh, but it's um, still work. And it's very important to separate the work from friends and family to keep in the balance and not burn out, but also not to be so that some things don't come across as too harsh, for example, because um, yeah, it's definitely, um, that's like a bit of a misconception that I think might be true in very early, teams that like launch together as friends but later it looks like not a typical company but it it has to do company things it too has to become profitable for example right right and I, would you say because we're having this this discussion lately here in berlin uh on what might be different kind of characteristics uh looking at different ages right for for new team members and There, I think there was a famous quote of one Berlin uh, startup founder who said, I'm not gonna hire any more people that are below, I think it was 28 or something, because they all, uh, they all are only looking at, uh, you know, work-life balance and they have to go to yoga uh, punctually <laughs> at 4, 4 p.m. in the afternoon. <laughs> so would you say there are any, you know, stereotype differences, differences in particular looking at people that are coming directly from university or or is it just more like a myth and, and kind of the usual, well, it was all better in the past, uh, the usual, uh, let's say, generation conflict that... that I that have to stop also... you right there. Excuse me. I need to go to my yoga class. <laughs> 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 well, you're 29. Right? So I just turned 30, should, should actually. <laughs> I did yoga. I did my yoga class this morning. It's seven, seven to eight thirty every Tuesday morning. All oh, right. But um, I mean, it's like a discrimination, right? It's the same like any other discrimination. It's age discrimination. Um, of course, it's totally not uh, true. You have all the counter examples. Um, you have very young people that are extremely, also in our team, that are extremely disciplined and like super. Yeah, really mature and far ahead. And then um, probably you can find some older people where it's not yet the case. Also, I think it totally doesn't make sense. You can try to, it's like, it's basically you can try to, you can try to increase your chances of success by going like by some patterns and like looking in some direction. You think the chance is a bit higher. But we're not, um, I mean, in the end of the day, when we say 1.5% conversion, we're looking for the very, unique kind of one-off situations that are hard to find in any age group and in any also school or non-school background, for example. We have people from kind of top schools, um, some of the really top business schools to no school, like they never went to university. But um, that's one of the things that if we can manage to continue to do it, I would be very proud of at Vulnerability that you have, everybody can become anything 
here and the way in is really able to assess you to um, who you are in the moment and that trajectory that you're on regardless of um, um, some data that's not about actually delivery and impact. We have ways into the company that are very, uh, um, that I think make that possible, yeah. I, I think that's really wonderful that you take a holistic approach to evaluating candidates and it gives sort of yourself multiple opportunities to have data points to understand them better, but it also gives, it sounds like, the, the potential candidates an opportunity to really understand what Wonder Mobility is about before they show up, which is probably why it's a little bit more difficult for you to answer that question, what are the misconceptions that people have? If it's only a 1.5% sort of making it to that point, they've had a lot of oppor opportunity to see, see what Wonder is about and to make a decision for themselves whether or not Wonder is the right fit. Um, and this sort of goes back, I mean, again, it's, it's, a, it's a very data-centered approach that I think is, is, is really fascinating and, and um, should be something that other organizations look at as well. I think I want to bring it back now. It's a little bit about data be, to the platform um, <laughs> because I think that the marketplace is really, really interesting. And in a lot of work that I have been doing recently um, with, with all sorts of players in the mobility space, data is one of the questions that people always have questions about. Um, it's one of those topics that, that it seems to, to never go away. Um, and so I'm curious as to how Wonder is thinking about uh, the use of data, how Wonder is sort of using that data, and, and, and what do you see the sort of the use of data, uh, how does it growing in the platform um, in the future for you all? Mm -hmm. There are different areas where we can make use of the data that we have. So you have basically almost 100 um, new mobility operators running their services in our platform, and we can see how everything is going. Um, that gives us insight into, for example, which um, vehicles work well or have more downtimes than others, or into which operations are more effective, and we can dig deeper to understand how they run their operations differently from others. Um, to also who will likely be um, successful um, um, in the near future, more successful than others. And we can translate that into um, our financial services product, which is giving um, actually, you know, funding um, loans and revenue share agreements to um, clients that we can see are um, on a good trajectory. So we can even, um, we can then um, strike deals with um, hardware manufacturers um, to push um, certain vehicles. Um, we can um, um, see yeah, what tools are used um, in what way and um, bring them into our marketplace um, and we can um, yeah, crowd out expensive and not very data-driven allocated um, venture capital to provide um, more um, flexible and cheaper and non-controlling um, capital to operators. So it gives us a lot of um, opportunities and um, we are definitely only at the beginning of using that um, fully. It's quite clear. We could be a multitude um, bigger in all these different areas that I just touched, like vehicles, operations, tools, financing, um, and just use what we already have and then make our clients more successful with that, for sure. Kunar, um, I'll have a last question for you. What what can we expect in the future, uh, talking about Wunder Mobility? Uh, you know, we experienced the launch of the new marketplace, which was... Uh, I, I guess surprising in a positive way for for uh, the stakeholders in, in new mobility. So what's out there for 2021 in particular? Um, we can't give it all away because competition. <laughs> but um, but I think that um, we we have always um, the operator in mind, the person who wants to bring shared electric mobility into their um, cities, um, and they have still. A lot of needs and by and large on average are struggling most of them are not profitable yet some of them are luckily we have the good examples but um, we are gonna keep making their life a lot easier with um, leverage that we have by provisioning technology to um, a lot of them but also by bundling what they need and turning around to others and say okay we need an attractive product for this from insurance from vehicles from others um, and then we're gonna 
have this mix of products that we give to our um, clients that are just found by us and presented to them, um, or um, a co-development between us and a partner, or developed entirely in-house. And that's kind of a little bit the, the direction um, I'm setting. It's going to be uh, kind of a mix of products all around what this um, um, target audience needs, um, and that come about in different ways. <laughs> that's the best way I can describe it. All right. Gunnar, thank you so much for your time. Uh, thanks for for you know answering all of our, our question. All the best for for uh, for the future of Wonder Mobility. Uh, and again, thank you so much for your time. Thanks a lot.